Good morning, bonjour, good afternoon, bon, uh, bonsoir à tout le monde. And uh, thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar on making gender equality part of the discussion on managing the current debt crisis. My name is Erin Tanzi. I am the director of the in Sustainable Inclusive uh, Economies Division at the IDRC here in Ottawa. Um, and I'm speaking to you from Ottawa. Um, and I'd like to just begin by acknowledging that the land on which our office is based is on the traditional unceded territory of the Ashinaabe, uh, Algonquin Ashinaabe people. So a few housekeeping issues, although I'm aware most of you have heard these over and over before, um, but I'll just go through them and I know some of them are already on the chat. So first of all, we have uh, French and English interpretation available. So to listen in your preferred language, you just click the interpretation button, which is at the bottom of your screen, and then you select the language that you wish to, to listen. Alors, nous, nous disposons des services d'interprétation en français et en anglais. Pour écouter ce webinaire dans la langue de votre choix, cliquez le bouton Interprétation en bas de votre écran. Sélectionnez ensuite la langue que vous souhaitez entendre. Number two, please be aware that we are broadcasting this event live on our Facebook page. We're also recording it and we'll share it with you uh, on YouTube um, and, our, and it will be on our website as well. So we invite you to ask questions to our panelists at any time during the event. So please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. The panelists will answer these questions, hopefully if we've got enough time to squeeze them in, um, but that'll be after the main discussion. So we'll share the questions the panelists are answering in the chat box. And you're also free to use the chat box to communicate to the other participants that are listening in on this call. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to be the moderator of this event, which has a fantastic lineup of experts, expert speakers uh, and researchers and academics. So it's my pleasure to be hosting this jointly with PEP. It's, uh, PEP is the Nairobi-based uh, Global Network Partnership for Economic Policy. And I'd like to thank colleagues and friends there for organizing this event. Uh, we have a fi fantastic lineup of speakers with Jayati Ghosh, Diane Elson, Jane Mariara, and Andrew Hurst. And I'll first, well, I'll introduce them later, but first, just a few remarks from my side on why we're here to begin with. So as you know, the COVID-19 crisis has had an enormous impact globally, but it has had distinct impacts. So it's had distinct impacts on different groups and on different countries. The economic impact in lower income countries is severe. Over 100 million people uh, were pushed into poverty just within the first year of the onset of the pandemic. And the crisis has had distinct gendered impacts. Women are suffering disproportionately in labor markets and the unequal burden for unpaid care work has worsened as I'm sure everyone has heard and knows and has experienced probably. Um, and it's been described also in some recent papers done by IDRC. So as the UN Secretary General said just this week, on Monday, I think it was, uh, the world faces severe problems of debt sustainability in the wake of the coronavirus crisis that have not been properly understood or addressed. So this conflict threatens to tip developing countries into a rising wave of hunger, poverty, social unrest and conflict. On top of the economic crisis, many low-income countries now face a problem of public debt. About half the lower-income countries, uh, half of lower-income countries face what the World Bank call, calls high levels of debt distress. New initiatives for debt relief are being taken, but the current commitments are unlikely to be sufficient. Moreover, and this is the subject of the webinar and the webinar we organized on Tuesday with Ambassador Ray and others, um, countries now face a triple crisis. It's the crisis of the pandemic, of, the, of economic stagnation and growing debt, and ever-growing climate change impact. So as the panel on Tuesday emphasized, these crises need to be addressed in an integral way. International support is key, and affected countries need the technical means to formulate effective and inclusive policies. 
we do have a, a recording of that uh, of that webinar. So um, if you were interested in listening to what was said on Tuesday, please um, please circle back with IDRC. So the question for today's webinar are: How do economic and particularly debt crises impact gender inequalities? And what policies and approaches can promote gender equality <clears throat> during the current crises in economic recovery, and particularly in the economic policies that ad address the debt crisis that are being formulated right now? So for these questions, we have a panel of eminent speakers and panelists. So we will first hear from our keynote, our keynote from Professor Jayati Ghosh. She is a professor uh, who's taught economics at um, Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi for over 30 years. And she's currently professor of economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst in the United States and is actively engaged in many international initiatives to promote uh, an inclusive recovery from the pandemic. So Jayati, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Erin. And I'm really happy that IDRC is actually uh, getting into the specific issue of the gender concerns in debt relief. I'm not really going to focus so much on the um, how the uh, crisis is affecting debt, because I think everybody knows that here, I, I imagine. What I'm going to emphasize instead is what we can do uh, in terms of the debt relief and the kinds of conditionalities that are typically associated with debt relief. So if you look at it, uh, what one of the first things we really need to do is to avoid the mistakes of the past. And what have we learned from the various types of debt relief? That they are oriented wrongly. They focus on rescheduling rather than restructuring the debt, which really means they kick the can down the road and that can gets bigger and bigger and doesn't solve any problems. They provide very small reductions and that has very little impact on the total debt stocks and therefore it doesn't really affect the fiscal situation of most governments. And so they don't end up doing very much in terms of alleviating the stress that is faced by debtor countries. Usually this comes because of the wrong diagnosis of the external debt problem, that it's temporary illiquidity, so you only have to postpone, rather than what is effectively insolvency, which requires absolute and usually large reductions in the total debt burden. I know that these were already discussed in the previous seminar that you held, so I'm not going to dwell on this, the bottom line is that uh, we've provided in the past much less debt relief than is required and in the wrong form. What's an additional concern today is that there's going to be a potential for a lot of free riding by private creditors because increasingly about 30% of developing country debt, even among the acutely stressed uh, indebted countries, is in terms of private creditors providing to private agencies within the economy. And there is a very strong case that they would free ride on any debt relief that is provided. So basically, what do we say? We say that it's no longer possible to go by the old standard mechanisms of debt relief. We really have to think differently and think big if there's going to be any impact. The problem also is that a lot of debt relief has involved conditionalities, which are typically linked, as we know, to the IMF agreements. Most uh, debtor countries sign an agreement with the IMF, along with getting the various compensation packages or relief packages. We have found that these conditionalities are not just gender blind, which is the usual polite way of putting it. They actually actively impact women more adversely and they disempower women disproportionately. This is the case even in the current pandemic. There was a study done with looking at 76 of the 91 IMF loans that were negotiated with 81 countries during this period since March 2020. And we find that there are cuts in public expenditure, which effectively result in public healthcare systems being frozen or reduced, pension schemes being frozen, wages being in, uh, frozen or cut for public sector workers like doctors, nurses, teachers, employment, unemployment benefits being cut, sick pay being reduced, cash transfers for those unable to work being reduced, and also a very significant emphasis on regressive taxes, particularly the, VAT, the value added taxes, which we know are disproportionately affecting the poor. And they impact women particularly adversely, especially women small entrepreneurs, a point that we, we can come back to. Now, supposing we consider the 
ways in which these things impact women in their different roles as workers in paid employment. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in, in the next uh, slide. As self-employed workers, especially uh, in micro enterprises, the MSME, MSME sector, as uh, migrant workers, as unpaid workers within households and communities, uh, providing a lot of the care, as those who are ultimately seen as responsible for you know, household access to basic provisions. Of course, women are the ones engaged in biological reproduction with associated life cycle requirements, and these too are affected by the kinds of conditions or restrictions on public spending that are put in. And of course, as citizens, we know that the pandemic and the lockdowns have already impacted on women in many ways, not only through greater physical violence against women, but also in many ways reducing their political voice in the community. What do we know about women as uh, recognized workers? I say recognized because we all know that they do a lot of unrecognized work and unpaid work. It's very clear in general, and there's a lot of studies to support this, that women are more likely to be rationed out of what are seen as good jobs or desirable formal jobs. And they are more likely to face job losses and unemployment whenever there's labor market stress. It's already clear, and this is across the world, that more women relatively have lost paid jobs. They face lower wages and more difficult working conditions than men. So while absolute numbers of men's jobs loss may be greater, relative to women's uh, workforce participation, women have disproportionately lost employment and are facing greater reductions in wages. And of course, we all know it was already mentioned by Erin that the burden of unpaid domestic care work has greatly increased. One of the critical aspects of this pandemic is that despite the significance of health and the importance of care activities, which should have been evident to all, women frontline health workers are still underpaid, undervalued, underprotected. Care work is still not adequately respected or remunerated. And this is widespread. Labor market conditions have worsened. And so the frontline women healthcare workers and other care workers, sanitation workers and others, are really facing the brunt of this. And somehow societies and governments have not responded by actually providing much greater respect, remuneration, recognition. There's another interesting angle, the women in global value chains, uh, which are being affected by the dual impacts of the pandemic and technologies, because companies are turning much more to more capital intensive and automated technologies. So we find that women who are in GVCs are being forced to work in extremely unhealthy and dangerous conditions. And of course, if they lose their jobs, then they lose their livelihoods. And so Literally, it's a situation of they are damned if they work and damned if they don't. And we find also that women in agriculture and in micro enterprises are facing legal and regulatory barriers that are making it much more difficult even during the pandemic. This is what is already happening. Now let's consider what we can do and what's been happening so far. Uh, I've already argued this, that you know a lot of uh, the debt relief packages of the past have uh, supposedly been gender neutral, but in fact have been effectively anti-women. And that's because they implicitly rely on a gender division of labor. And they utilize the fact that the unpaid and underpaid work of women will cushion any fiscal austerity. So really governments and the international organizations that are pushing through austerity packages basically rely on the fact that this will be met within households by the unpaid labor of women. And of course, cutbacks in certain kinds of public expenditure, not just in terms of service provision, but also public provision of food, public provision of other basic needs. All of these disproportionately impact women, not only because they have reduced access, but because they are the ones left filling the gap. Now, obviously, this is bad from an equity, welfare, and justice point of view. But I would argue that it's also economically stupid because it results in worsening material conditions and it lowers the chances of stable and sustainable recovery from a debt crisis, which presumably is what debt relief is supposed to do. I also want to emphasize that you know, a lot of the uh, newer generation uh, packages put in a lot of phrases. They do a lot of the hand waving or symbolism that is required, You know that we are women friendly and gender sensitive. And I think it's really important to cut through all of that 
and to avoid just purely symbolic or minor gestures or have a, a little bit of you know a focus on women specific programs because if it is a wider package that makes women worse off then a few programs here and there or a little bit of some you know stated symbolic gestures these are really not of much use and we should not be allowed to get sidetracked by those so I argued that a basic principle for all of these adjustment packages should be do no harm. And of course the harm can occur in many ways. So let's think of the various things that they should do. What are the things that uh, packages uh, should avoid, debt relief packages? First of all, it's already evident, don't provide relief that's so small and so delayed that it doesn't really alter the state's fiscal capacity. The point is to improve the state's fiscal capacity substantially not to reduce it further. And in general, it's wrong to impose fiscal austerity measures. It's better always to ensure counter-cyclicality. Developed countries have recognized this. They are going in for the biggest counter-cyclical packages we have ever seen, not just in my lifetime, but I would argue in the past century. Uh, unfortunately, this is not an option that is made available to debtor countries. And I think that's unacceptable. But essentially, fiscal measures that explicitly or implicitly reduce spending on public provision of essential services and public wage bills, those should be absolutely not acceptable. So any fiscal cuts or spending limits that involve reducing public services, reducing public wage bills should not be accepted in parts of these uh, uh, debt relief packages. Monetary policies also tend to be very pro-cyclical and often rigid regulations on banking and on credit provision, they further worsen the position of micro-entrepreneurs, women borrowers, and microfinance institutions also. We've seen across the world significant stress on microfinance institutions, which then comes down to the lowest level and affects women in self-help groups and others particularly. Also, in terms of things to avoid, don't allow the prices of essential commodities to increase, especially through VAT. Unfortunately, I already mentioned this, across the world today, all the, in the midst of the pandemic, VATs are being increased or fuel taxes are being increased in ways that directly impact the spending possibilities of poorer households and women in particular. This, uh, this next point is repeating what I said earlier. Don't expect specific programs targeted to women or children to undo the damage that is created by broader economic policies, which are reducing employment and livelihoods. They will not undo that damage and they should not be used as excuses to engage in those other broader policies. Also, I would argue that a lot of formalization policies don't actually benefit women workers because they are gender insensitive and sometimes actively working against the conditions that women workers face, informal women workers face. So I would say avoid the formalization policies that harm women, especially in self-employment. Of course, there are positive things that can be done. I don't want to be only negative. And uh, I'm listing a few that are, I think, particularly important changing the structure of taxation by focusing on more progressive taxation. For example, equitable taxation of multinationals. There is a proposal for unitary taxation of multinationals, which we can talk about in the question answer if necessary. Taxes on extreme wealth, taxes on financial transaction. I think the Biden administration is already showing how these things can be done and how you can actually increase the highest rate of tax, marginal taxation on the extremely rich. Along with that, massively increase public spending on healthcare and education. The aim should be universal and affordable access to good quality public services with adequate employment, not understaffed and overworked public workers. Particularly women in all these public employment programs must receive proper wages and working conditions. We have too many women workers at the front lines classified as ancillary workers or volunteers who are not even paid minimum wages, not given all the basic protections of workers. It's very important now we have an incipient and in fact in some cases an actual food crisis in about 120 countries. And it's very important to focus on universal access to food and nutrition because it's also, it's not just food supply constraints, it's livelihood losses coinciding with rising prices of food, which are affecting women and children and girl children in particular in many countries. 
there is a strong case for public employment programs because we know that livelihood losses are so widespread and job losses are so widespread that it's critical to provide an alternative source of public employment. And the scope of such employment should be expanded to encompass services, not just include you know, very hard manual labor, but all activities that improve the quality of life and more green activities that address environmental concerns. There are good examples of how this is being done in certain parts of the world, and these should really be multiplied, and these should be explicitly mentioned in the debt relief packages. In terms of banking regulation, you really have to think of internal debt relief as well. And so especially for the micro, small and medium enterprises and for women-owned small enterprises who are often in informal credit arrangements, there have to be ways in which you ensure their continued access to credit and you ensure that that access is not so expensive as to wipe them out financially within the economy. Women entrepreneurs also have very, very specific needs. Everyone knows this about access to inputs and markets. These are typically ignored completely in all such packages. They're left to fend for themselves in a situation where all of these things are rationed further. And we know when there is rationing that the women get excluded. We also really have to emphasize the ability for women to associate, to unionize. Uh, both employed and self-employed women. And we really must encourage the formation of producer cooperatives, marketing cooperatives, and so on. All this is really part, I would say, of a broader vision, which is that uh, I, I've called it a multicolored global new deal rather than just green. Because it is a new deal in, this, in the old Roosevelt sense, based on the three R's of recovery, regulation, and redistribution, and the recovery based on very significantly increased public expenditure. Uh, once again, you know, you find that the US government is doing a lot of these things for itself. It is not extending that generosity of allowing other countries to do that. But that is something I hope that can be changed. And why does it have to be multicolored? Because it has to obviously be green, we know that, and also blue. I think water is a very, very major issue across the developing world and in the highly indebted countries. And therefore, it's not just about environment and climate challenges. I think there's a real necessity to focus on water. It should be purple, the care economy. It must emphasize the care economy, rewarding care work through greater public spending, recognizing, reducing, and redistributing unpaid care work. Diane is here who introduced us to all of these important concepts and representing care workers. And it has to be read, it has to reduce inequalities, which have, were obscene before the pandemic started. And now they have just exploded beyond any kind of sustainable form. Inequalities in assets and in incomes in assets to food, access to essential public services, employment opportunities. And of course, because inequalities are intersectional, you have to reduce these across different dimensions, gender, race, ethnicity, caste, location, age, all of these. And for this, we require an international architecture as well. I'm not going to dwell on this, I've already exceeded my time, but I really do believe that we need to have an appropriate architecture that will enable developing countries, including debtor countries, to do what advanced countries are doing. That is through controlled and capital flow, uh, controls on capital flows, through revised rules for trade and intellectual property rights, through tax cooperation, I've already mentioned that, through a new allocation of SDRs by 500 billion SDR, not dollars. So that would be $650 billion. And encouraging rich countries to share their allocation, which they're not going to use anyway, to share this, especially with highly indebted countries. And have a Marshall Plan for Health Recovery, a peace clause in the WTO, and a standstill on all the investor state dispute settlements, which are preventing many developing countries from undertaking precisely these kind of measures that I have outlined. Okay, that's it, and thank you. Thank you so much, Jayati. That was just uh, uh, amazing. Lots of inc just incredible um, information and knowledge. I, I had the pleasure of being able to read your paper before this, um, uh, before the this webinar. Um, and I just want to tell everyone that um, Jayati's paper will be made available. Uh, so you can take a look at it in more detail on the IDRC website. So, um, so if you want to have more information, <clears throat> you can find it there. 
So um, yeah, I, I think now it's a, it's a good time to, to switch over to um, Diane Elson um, for a brief commentary on what uh, Prof has just outlined um, and her view and on, on, on priorities and so, uh, so forth. So Professor Elson is Emeritus Professor at the University of Essex in the UK. For most of you, she needs no introduction at all, uh, but it's important to highlight that she was a teacher to many people, um, many people probably even in this, in this panel, and a global leader in bringing gender into economic thinking. So over to you, Diane. Thank you, thank you. So I strongly support what Jayati has uh, already said. And what I want to use my short few minutes to do is to elaborate a little bit more on the purple element of the multicolored global New Deal. Purple, by the way, because in many countries, the struggle for votes for women was uh, embrace the color purple on banners and uh, on sashes and dresses and so forth. So that's why it's purple. So to elaborate on this a little bit further, I think the debt restructuring should be linked to big new investments to create high quality public care systems, healthcare, but not only healthcare, also childcare and care for adults with disabilities, including those linked to old age, what in some countries is called social care. Funding for this needs to be made available uh, via budget support, I think, linked to a well-designed care-led recovery plan that the countries themselves are designing, but in which women are taking the lead in designing, both as providers of health and other care services and as users of health and other care services. Jyoti had some interesting data in her paper about the, the way in which women are the great majority of care providers, but they're also uh, the great majority of users of care, both for themselves and for the people that they're taking care of in their families and their households. So these care-led recovery plans have to have women taking the lead in designing them. They can't be handed over to international consultants and uh, representatives from private sector. The plan should be to create high quality publicly provided health and other care services accessible to all, but including centrally the upgrading of the pay and conditions of low paid care workers, including those whom I mentioned, the community workers who so often classified as volunteers and not workers, even though they are workers and they're not paid. So it has to be central is the expansion of high quality care services and you're not going to get high quality care services if you don't treat the workers who are providing them better. This would need to be monitored against formal KPIs, um, which could be it could be agreed between the uh, countries and the and the um, debt relief community. But they also need to be monitored through citizen led participatory processes in which I think women's share of membership should reflect their share of providers and users of care services. So it needs to be well beyond 50-50. I think women need to be about 70% of the representatives of providers and users of care in the structures for citizen monitoring uh, of the implementation of care-led recovery plans. These kind of plans will create large numbers of new jobs with good terms and conditions and narrow gender gaps in employment and in wages. They also increase productivity. Ill health is one of the main uh, barriers to increasing productivity. Uh, and they'd also increase productivity by releasing women from some of their unpaid work so as to be able to spend more time in paid work, both uh, as employees and self-employed. And that childcare component would ensure that children are well prepared for school. So it increased productivity. It will also stimulate production and, and employment throughout the economy 
by backward and forward linkages, which are very strong for healthcare. You could start to think of a healthcare industrial, a healthcare led industrial strategy. So by focusing on care, we are going to address both gender equality issues, women's well-being, but also ripple out more broadly into the structure of the economy, productivity and employment creation. And I, I would hope that focusing on the creation of health systems and other care systems that are resilient in the face of pandemics might be of interest to a wider range of creditors, might be of interest, for instance, to China, which is obviously uh, got a vaccine that um, could have a very positive impact if the systems are there to deliver it properly and might even be of interest to the private creditors, the, the, which are going to be a big problem, but maybe private creditors might be susceptible to a bit of naming and shaming about how far they are bearing responsibility for the perpetuation of the pandemic in low income countries and in ways that will come back to bite us in the rich countries too. So I fully support Dioti's points about you can't address gender equality by tagging on a few uh, small uh, women targeted programs. You've got to think comprehensively and think big. Uh, and I just tried to elaborate a little bit farther what the purple element of this, of this rainbow uh, New Deal might be. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diane, um, for highlighting these priorities. Well, 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 well said. Um, I'd just like to, to encourage the audience to uh, write your questions in the Q&A or in the chat because we'll, uh, after the, the next two speakers, we will have time to, to, to have, uh, have some questions. So please, please go ahead. So now we turn to Professor Jane Mariara. Um, she's the executive director of, the, of PEP, and she is um, a co-organizer of this meeting. Um, over to you, Jane. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and uh, thank you for this opportunity. I'm going to share my slides. Um, I don't know what to say, uh, speaking after very powerful speakers. Uh, what I was asked to speak about is not uh, really a commentary on uh, what Jayati has um, as, present and done, but it's more of to talk about what we are doing uh, in PEP to ensure that uh, we bring into account or we, we take into account gender equality uh, in our macro modeling, because that would also have implications on issues to do with uh, maybe fiscal stance, uh, debt in these countries, and so forth. Um, I, I don't know whether you can see my slides. I hope you can. Uh, so uh, very quickly, yeah, what I'm going to talk about is, uh, as I've said first, I want to talk about uh, what we do with uh, macro gender modeling in PEP. And this is through our modeling policy impact analysis uh, approach, uh, whereby we use computable general equilibrium models, which we all know uh, that these are kind of uh, uh, laboratories uh, that can be used to simulate a drink, the impact of macro shorts and policies to, in, to economic sectors and poverty. And we know that this is where uh, women actually are mostly concentrated in, and this is what we've had from our excellent keynote speak, uh, I mean, uh, speech. Uh, our computable general equilibrium models, of course, allow us to track the transmission channels of policy differentiating between men and women, and also showing the spillovers of multiplier effects of policies throughout the economy. And again, Jayati has brought this out uh, very clearly. So what we do in PEP actually is to train our researchers uh, on building and using the computable general equilibrium models to ensure that we have gender sensitive uh, research and uh, we started this in the early 2000s, uh, in the early 2000s, just as after PEP started. Uh, before 2013, we had just a few projects between three and five, 
which were really gender focused. Uh, but over the last couple of years, we've uh, done much more. And currently, we have 15 uh, projects which are ongoing and they are available on our uh, websites. In the past, we focused on uh, issues to do with the trade, uh, agriculture, energy, uh, linking the shops and policies. But uh, currently, we have work that is focusing on uh, COVID-19, climate change, and other issues which we'll be talking about. Then the question is, why JEDA or why JEDA at macroeconomic analysis? Uh, Jayati has given us a very good background on this, so I'll not repeat, but just to say that uh, Speaking from where she has left, we can just say that uh, gendered policy responses can help first to reduce the disparity between men and women if we target properly. And then it can also help to support disparity. Uh, to, sorry, it can also help to support current and future economic growth. And most important, uh, costs, costs that are um, uh, related to get a policy responses could actually force governments to borrow uh, money from foreign governments and therefore accumulate uh, debt. And finally, uh, analysis of economic policies uh, with gendered uh, computable general equilibrium models uh, consider differentiated impacts on men and women and also the intensity of female and male labor in the sectors of the econ of an economy. And again, Jayati has uh, presented this uh, very well. So what are we doing uh, currently at PEP? Uh, without going into the details of the programs that we are focusing on, uh, what I would say is that uh, the issues that we are actually researching on um, have uh, great impact on gender or they all link to gender. And uh, where this links to death and other issues uh, is because most of the African governments that we are dealing with, and even uh, the rest of the world where we work, uh, we know that uh, these issues uh, involve government using their budgets, either to fund subsidies, uh, it could be social protection, uh, it could be uh, other forms of targeting, uh, public investments, and so forth. And uh, uh, our projects are highlighting how most African governments um, actually uh, do not have enough fiscal space to uh, have deliberate policies that target gender. And therefore, this is likely to drive countries into borrowing and increasing the already high debts in many of our countries. And again, Gayati uh, has uh, mentioned that. So the key priorities, even in our macro modeling, uh, equilibrium, uh, general equilibrium modeling, is really the question of data. Uh, this type of models uh, mostly require data disaggregated data, uh, such as uh, national accounts, integrated economic accounts, uh, balance of payments, and uh, 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 micro surveys, household surveys, living uh, uh, standards measurement surveys, and so forth. Most of these data are available in these countries uh, where we have a deficit is really in time use surveys. And this is where maybe we need to concentrate on. Uh, so finally, uh, what are the outlook and the next challenges uh, that we see as PEP? Uh, what we are doing to ensure that uh, we can um, In macro modeling, uh, we are developing material, teaching materials. We've been developing teaching materials, but we are expanding this. And uh, we have materials on gender sensitive economy wide modeling and also online courses where we are teaching participants. We are looking at uh, materials on environmental aspects. Uh, that relates to climate change impacts, energy, carbon pricing, and women. And then we have issues of capital markets in uh, computable general equilibrium models. Our next step is actually to extend our CGE models uh, by uh, analyzing more the aspects of formal and informal uh, markets where we know that uh, most women are concentrated in the informal markets, and then also uh, representation that allows us to analyze public debt. And as I've already mentioned, the data requirements uh, is basically more gender disaggregated statistics and more time use surveys for micro simulation. I think I need to emphasize this because we have good macro data. 
but the data that can be allow us to look at that, the, at the, the women who are the lower uh, percentile of the distribution of income is missing. And this is where the time use surveys come in. Thank you, Chair. That's what I wanted to share. Oh, thank you so much, Jane, for, for uh, really getting into the granularity of, of how we go about uh, sort of, you know, coming to, to, to changing policies. I think it's, it's with these types of tools that you've developed and, and uh, taken forward that will give us the, um, the, the um, you know, the advocacy and the tools and the knowledge to be able to change the minds of, of, of policymakers. So just fantastic, uh, fantastic work there. Um, I, I wanted to now um, introduce you to our, our final uh, speaker today. Um, Andrew Hurst is from our Team Canada. So he's part of Global Affairs Canada. Um, Andrew actually used to be um, at IDRC. He was head of the Think Tank Initiative. Um, but he's currently the Director of Economic Growth and International Financial Institutions at Global Affairs in Ottawa. So he will, um, it will be great to hear your perspectives on what you've heard today, Andrew, over to you. Uh, thanks, Aaron. And uh, again, uh, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. I feel uh, very honored to be a uh, part of this very distinguished panel. Um, and I will try and uh, speak to some of these issues from uh, my position within the bureaucracy. Um, just uh, before I, I get into a couple of comments, just to say that, um, uh, and, and I need to, to uh, acknowledge uh, that with my finance, Department of Finance colleagues, they are the ones that lead for Canada and engagements uh, at the IMF and, and in G20 on debt issues in particular. Um, but uh, my responsibilities do touch on development policy and international assistance uh, insofar as it connects to these issues. So it's from that perspective that I will be speaking, uh, as well as, you know, more generally, uh, as uh, from my experience as a policymaker and how to move the needle, perhaps on some of these issues. Um, so I'll just make three, uh, three general comments and then uh, to start and then uh, three comments on I think how we want to get from where we are now to where we would all like to be. Um, the first thing is obviously to, to absolutely acknowledge and confirm uh, uh, many of the things that uh, the other panelists have noted on the, the critical uh, situation that the pandemic has highlighted around uh, gender equality and, and the, the um, unequal uh, distribution, for instance, of care work on women and girls in particular. Um, you know, this is something that we are very seized with. Uh, and obviously we are um, looking for ways as much as possible to, to address some of these issues in, in the ways that Canada is, is helping to respond to the global pandemic. And it bears restating as well um, that uh, obviously the, the way these impacts are being felt has uh, everything to do with um, uh, other, other um, um, aspects of identity and, and marginality that uh, have already been mentioned. And, and this is, I think, particularly important to note because uh, many of the people uh, who would, who would um, fall into these communities or groups often are outside current social protection systems and outside political discussions for, uh, for obvious reasons. Um, so Canada is, in, is very much uh, uh, seized with these issues. As I mentioned, we have a feminist international assistance policy. Development has explicit, uh, explicit commitment in our mandate letter to, to look for ways to address uh, paid care, unpaid care and paid care workers. Uh, and so she is very seized with this issue uh, as well. Um, and just to, uh, to have a shameless plug, uh, we are co-hosting an event with Oxfam at the, as part of the World Bank Spring Meetings uh, on the 13th, uh, looking at um, uh, ways of investing in the care economy as, as uh, part of uh, recovering from the global pandemic. So if any of you are registered for those meetings, I would Other panelists have noted the 
the situation of uh, debt as it presently stands. Um, the, one of the additional things to note, which is complicating matters, of course, is that it's much more, uh, it's a different situation this time around. The number of creditors is, is, uh, is very different from the last time uh, we had a significant um, uh, conversations about debt restructuring and debt relief uh, at the turn of the millennium. Um, and many uh, emerging markets and uh, non-Paris club countries are now significant uh, creditors, uh, which means that the traditional structures set up to have these kind of kinds of conversations are not necessarily fit for purpose. We've also have uh, an increase in the percentage of, of private creditors uh, uh, in terms of the debt um, exposure in some of these countries, um, all of which has made negotiations difficult. Um, there's a, there are issues of transparency as well, uh, knowing exactly how much uh, debt is actually out there. Uh, and that, that has, for better or for worse, um, uh, shaped a lot of how uh, conversations around this have, uh, have unfolded. Um, the other thing that's been a challenge, of course, is that um, to date, uh, whether it's the debt service suspension initiative or even the common framework, is only open to, uh, to low-income countries or IDA-eligible countries. And there are many middle income countries, obviously, that, that face many of the same issues. Um, these discussions are taking place in the G20, which, as many have noted, does not include um, uh, debtor countries. And it's one of the reasons why uh, Canada, um, uh, led by our prime minister, has tried to convene uh, jointly with uh, the UN and the prime minister from Jamaica discussions on uh, financing for development in the COVID uh, context and beyond uh, to, to at least allow for a more inclusive conversation on some of these issues. Uh, the final comment uh, is just in terms, of course, the uh, IFIs are central to many of these discussions. Um, gender is something that uh, certainly Canada and many other countries have been pushing uh, at um, uh, and with the, the IFIs for a number of years now. Um, there have been some successes in terms of their uh, ad adoption of, of uh, updated gender policies and strategies and targets and so on. Um, Ida 19 included commitments on, on gender as an example. We continue to push for a greater ambition, um, but uh, as I'll uh, make clear in a, a later comment, this is probably not sufficient. Um, so I think what the main thing I, that probably everybody's keen to uh, get into today is, you know, we all have, we have a good sense of where we are now, but how, we, how do we get from where we are to where we would like to be? How do we make sure that uh, these issues are addressed in pandemic recovery and that some of the longstanding uh, are finally addressed? Um, the first, and I'll make three, three comments on, on this. The first is that, as I alluded to earlier, um, you know, and, and there's a role for researchers in helping us figure this out. How do we go beyond the, uh, our efforts in, in, in getting these institutes, getting MDBs and, and, uh, and the IMF to include uh, gender in their policies and strategies? Um, there have been some discussions about policy conditionalities, uh, you know, the, and, and, and whether that's something that we should be pursuing. But uh, from my perspective, there are also risks in this, and arguably one of the reasons that um, some countries have turned to other sources of, of, uh, of credit is because of the, uh, the, those, the conditions that have come, for instance, with, with World Bank policy loans, whether they're environmental, social, or governance. Uh, um, conditionality. So that, that's a bit of a conundrum from my perspective. Um, there's also the question of, of how these institutions actually implement their policies. We know most of them have gender units uh, that are supposed to you know, generate the data, uh, um, um, broker the knowledge to help other parts of these institutions uh, integrate gender into their, into their operations, whether it's policy-based loans or other kinds of technical assistance. Um, you know, is this the most effective way to go? There's also the question, I think, about uh, the role of e economics and economists. Um, there are, uh, I think, uh, a need to, ha to broaden the, 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 um, the kinds of people that are in these institutions with no disrespect meant to the economists in the room, um, but to, uh, to other disciplines that, um, that would bring the kinds of perspectives to bear in these, in these institutions uh, to address these issues in, a, in more uh, profound and fundamental ways. 
The second point is around um, uh, the political economy at the national level in, in, in uh, countries in the global south. Um, clearly, there's only so much that, uh, that these that, um, global ins institutions can do. Uh, it, it's also, there's also clearly a role for governments in taking ownership of some of these issues and they won't do it without sustained pressure from, uh, uh, from communities in their own countries and from civil society in particular. Um, so Canada's invested uh, and, and provided a lot of funding to women's rights organizations over the last number of years. Um, uh, it, it remains to be seen how much that's uh, how much effect that that will have in the short term, but clearly this is something that uh, where there needs to be more support given, and the gender gender equality forum and all the uh, action coalitions associated with that I think are going to be an interesting um, space to watch. Um, finally, the, the third third comment uh, on way forward. And this is just speaking specifically to the research question. Um, uh, this year in particular, there's a huge emphasis on climate, um, given, uh, given COP26 coming up and to a lesser extent on biodiversity as well with COP, uh, uh, COP15. Um, my big concern is that in the push to address all of these things, that gender gets lost in, in the shuffle. So I really see a role for, uh, for um, the research community and, and uh, the, any advocates in the civil society world to, to team up and, and uh, bring forward ways of addressing some of these issues jointly. Um, how can we, how can we uh, come up with solutions that invest in the care economy while also uh, uh, you know, making progress on the, uh, on the climate agenda? Um, we absolutely need voices uh, from the South to do this. Um, we have some great examples uh, in the case of uh, the membership of Southern Voice as an example, but we don't only need them at national level in the, in, in the global South, we also need them at the global level. And so I would really encourage researchers and those in the research community to see it as uh, you know, something that they should be um, trying as much as possible to get their research onto those, into those international discussions and onto those global agendas. And I'm, I'm obviously very happy that IDRC is doing its best to help make that happen. So I will stop there because I think I've reached my time, but uh, very much looking forward to engaging uh, with everyone on these uh, very important issues. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew, and lovely to see you after so long. Um, uh, yeah, uh, great points, and thanks also for um, for mentioning the the event that's happening on the thirteenth with uh, with GAC and Oxfam. Um, IDRC is also part of that, so I think that will be a really interesting an interesting discussion. Um, I've got a few questions coming in. I've got one that's quite long. I'm just going to read it out. I think it's probably best. Um, uh, well, I don't actually don't even know. Let's see. I'm going to read it out and then the panelists can decide who wants to take it. So it says all terrific so far and wholly endorse everything, but very macro. Um, as solvency is the root problem, what are the most sectoral measures required to augment women's access to finance and micro enterprise enablers? Certainly sustaining a gender progressive recovery that endures and empowers women requires attention to property laws entitling collateral requirements for loans, access to telecoms for e-commerce and banking, gender and digitalization, and enlisting men who are successful entrepreneurs in low and middle income countries to enable access for women, youth, and those with new skills to augment productivity, income, and employment. Macro distribution to be sustained requires complementary targeted micro efforts. Do they not? <clears throat> Jayati, maybe you want to take a stab at that? Sure. Yes, thank you. No, listen, I agree completely with that. But I think the problem is really that people tend to focus on the micro initiatives because at one level, they're kind of easier to talk about and do not to actually implement, but just to talk about. The problem with debt relief is that it is a fundamentally macro phenomenon. And the problem with the debt relief packages is that the way they operate, they make the possibility of doing any of the micro initiatives that much worse. And so I think the reason we have focused on the macro is because that's where the, pro as you mentioned, the, 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 the lack, you know, the, the solvency issue is the problem that generates a particular set of policy responses, which make everything much worse. So I think the fundamental thing has to be, as I've mentioned before, do no harm. 
Mm. And yes, absolutely, we do all the other initiatives with respect to property laws, access to skills, da, 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 all of those things, you know, collateral. But if you actually reduce public spending on these essential items, if you do not prioritize care spending, then you are not going to solve those problems by giving, you know, by having better access to collateral for women borrowers. I, you know, just a quick response also, you know, Andrew, I completely agree with what you've said about conditionalities on governance can be a problem. And so you have to think about the conditionalities, but I think that's why it is so important for everyone to focus on the conditionalities that are creating a problem already. It's not only because of governance and things that people have turned off the IFIs and gone to China. It's because they also insist on dramatic reductions in critical areas and on austerity. So I think do no harm really has to become, you know, ingrained in everybody's foreheads to begin with. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I had a, another, another question, which was um, also to Diane and to Diety. If you could possibly give a point to some examples of the purple colored, um, the purple lead actions and, and how these can be supported. Maybe Diane? I think in different parts of the world, there are quite a lot of uh, women's organizations and feminist economists working exactly on that issue. How can we design care-led recoveries? What kinds of public investment do we need? And not only the total money we need, but how it's to be used. What kind of a service creating what kind of jobs with what kind of responsiveness to the people who need to use these services? Um, I think that is um, part of thinking in Canada and what I've seen there about what recovery should look like uh, in Hawaii, in the kind of plan that the state of Hawaii came up with. In the UK, we're thinking about what would a care-led uh, care recovery look like for the UK, doing research on this, estimating the employment that would be created compared with um, um, uh, spending on construction, estimating the um, emissions uh, that are generated by care services versus those generated by construction, far less polluting than industry. Uh, and I think there's thinking about this in India, there's thinking about this in Africa. How can we, and I think this also addresses this issue of both how, where are we now and where would we like to get to? Because we are now in a very serious health crisis that's then compounded by an economic crisis. But it began with a health crisis and the health crisis struck so hard because there had been so much underinvestment in health services and other care services around the world or what investment there'd be and really only address the needs of the well-off people who can afford to buy private care. And most people were left out or had poor quality access to services. And, and I think this is a good moment to focus on this because actually, and I speak from a country where we seem to be doing quite well on the vaccination, but it's not going to help us if the rest of the world doesn't get vaccinated. And the rest of the world is not going to be able to get vaccinated just with having vaccines. They need to be systems to deliver those vaccines and to provide the other supporting care that's needed. So I'm persuaded there's a lot of creative thinking about this at the moment, but I'm also know that it's still um, an issue to get governments to see this because they immediately when they talk think of recovery and building back better they, they interpret build very literally and they think it means a, a lot of construction sites a lot of roads a lot of railways a lot of highways maybe they also think of some solar uh, panels and some wind farms but to get them to think that spending on health education, childcare, social care is an investment. I think we critically have to get that point across, an investment that has an impact on employment, on productivity, on growth potential, as well as on well-being. And it shouldn't just be seen as current consumption. So we do have to change the way economists think about uh, how they categorize different kinds of public spending and really get them to see that it's outdated to think that spending on salaries in care services is just current consumption. 
it's not. It's just as much an investment as spending on building new clinics, new hospitals, new nurseries. But I think there's a lot of people thinking about these ideas and various fora in which these ideas are coming together. At CSW, um, just recently, the Commission for the Status of Women meetings in New York, uh, there were quite a lot of online webinars connected with that where people women in particular were discussing this idea, but I think it has potential for getting broader buy-in because it's not women specific, because it's not just care for women or care for girls. It's thinking of this in the sectoral term as the whole sector of activities that needs to be invested in in a certain kind of way, and it will bring benefits for everybody. Yeah, thank, thanks for that. I mean, it's re it requires such a mind shift as well <clears throat> in thinking. Um, <clears throat> but the, the the discussions are happening, as you said, with CSW and others. So, I, I mean, I'm 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 hopeful myself. But uh, I I thought I, I don't know, uh, um, Dieti, if you wanted to um, add, and then I'm gonna I've got a question for for Jane after that. Just very quickly, I completely agree with everything Diane said. I, I want to just mention the Indian state of Kerala. It's a state government operating under extreme fiscal constraint and uh, a, sort of a very uh, antipathetic central government. Nonetheless, there are some really interesting and quite remarkable initiatives in terms of orienting public and community action towards care provision. And it's, it's, it's very interesting because it is focused on women, but it's not only women. It's drawing everybody into care service provision. And I think that's a very interesting thing because I noticed there was a question on environment. They are also trying to link this with the current environmental challenges they face, which are a result of climate change and of pollution. But you know, it's possible if you think creatively and especially in slightly more local or meso levels, I think it's possible to do this. Great, thank you. Um, so over to you, Jane, maybe you can give um, some examples <clears throat> of how, um, or you could elaborate on where such research, the research that you outlined to us in the methodologies, how, um, where they have made a difference, you know, um, and, and in your experience, um, or maybe just at least point out what is what has been written up on all of these, um, these tools that you've, you've developed and, and used. Okay. and where uh, people could find them. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair, yeah. and thank you for all the speakers for the responses. Um, okay, first let me just say that, uh, just speaking from what the two speakers have uh, just said, I think there's a question on the chat where someone is saying that uh, uh, the issues of women, gender are only prioritized during normal uh, economic times or socioeconomic times, but during the pandemic, they are actually ignored. And uh, I was also going to agree with what the speakers are saying and say that uh, I know governments are trying the best they can, but I think we must recognize that uh, we've never had a pandemic before, not in the uh, recent past. And so I think because the systems are overwhelmed, I think the question sometimes is, is it to prioritize health? Is it to prioritize education? Uh, is it to prioritize care economy? And yet we know that women really are the ones who are left with the burden of the pandemic because when children can't go to school, the women are left to have to uh, think of how they are going to take care of them and also go to into their productive activities. When men cannot go to work and they are home and there's domestic violence, it's women who are suffering and so forth. Having said that, um, as I mentioned, uh, the work that we've been doing on gender and macroeconomic analysis, uh, most of the work that we have is actually ongoing. As I mentioned prior to 2013, we had just a few studies. Uh, and I think uh, most was the reason for that mostly was because of a uh, lack of very uh, good gender disaggregated data. But uh, we do have uh, um, impact stories in our, on, on our PEP website that maybe I would ask uh, uh, those who are interested, just go to our, our, our website and go to the, we call it MPIA. If you look at the MPIA program, Group for Impact Stories, you'll be able to see some of the examples of the work that we have done in the past and where it has been used to impact on policy. Now, of the 15 projects that I said are currently ongoing, uh, we have uh, some which are on COVID 
it. We just started, uh, supported by IDLC, we started uh, last year, and uh, we are still at the interim phase, so we can't say that it has really gone in to influence policy, but we are looking at, we are actually trying to do uh, micro simulations of how we can actually influence uh, COVID or anti-COVID policies or recovery after uh, COVID. We do have uh, some work that is on, uh, going also where we are looking at uh, the evaluation of uh, policy impacts in uh, um, uh, six countries in East and West Africa uh, on impact evaluation. Again, that is ongoing. Uh, these are field experiments so are slightly affected by uh, the pandemic. So we are actually going, we should have been completing the work, but it's going to be completed uh, towards the end of the year. And we have some uh, new work that we started with uh, Global Affairs Canada, which is looking at uh, the uh, distributive impacts of uh, uh, of, 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 of uh, climate change on uh, women and girls. Again, that is still at the infancy stage and finally our grow work. But, but basically, uh, we, we, we have very good data on our website that shows generally how uh, our pro specific projects have influenced policy in the home countries. And uh, I would uh, actually ask members to uh, refer to our uh, website. More than that, three percent of all the work that we have done has actually influenced policy directly. Thank you. Thanks, Jean. That's a that's a long a long list of of, uh, of things. Fantastic. Um, I, I guess in in you know coming from that, I mean w one of the questions. I mean I I see even just in in Jean you speaking, you know that. Um, um, you know how I, the question is like you know how do how are women's voice how women's voices and agency in the global south can be strengthened in all of this like this seems to me in, in a way to be and and please correct me if I'm wrong mm -hmm. you know the the um, the preoccupation with debt and the debt burden seems to be a a, a conversation that is being led by northern countries at this stage. And so how do we, how do we, how do we change that? And what are the things that we can do? Um, maybe Jane, you carry on and then I'll, I'll ask, I'll ask Jayati and, and Diane as well. Okay. Uh, thank you. And as I said, we do not really maybe have a lot of work on that, uh, though we have the broader uh, macro economy. But uh, when we talk about maybe giving women voice, giving agency, I think we've talked about uh, uh, maybe the sectors where women are concentrated. I think the enablement of women in those sectors, if we can actually ensure that uh, uh, where we have enough fiscal space, we can actually target those sectors, especially during the pand uh, pandemic, because a lot of countries are having the economic stimulus package. If we could uh, target some of the sectors that we know uh, women are really engaged in, it doesn't even have to be care economy, because I'll give an example, for instance, of uh, most African countries, and maybe even in the West. Uh, when the pandemic comes and uh, schools have to be closed, for instance, for almost a year, Year, the children uh, not only stay home, but you find that in the service sector, such as education, uh, most of the teachers are women. Unfortunately, in the private school system uh, in Kenya, maybe for about seven months, those women did not have any pay. Teachers in private schools did not have pay. Uh, when you look at the hospitality industry, uh, for instance, restaurants, tourism, uh, the service providers are also women. This is one sector that has been very hard hit by women. Uh, so the, the, uh, I mean, by the pandemic, uh, leading to unemployment for so many months. So if this uh, economic stimulus can target those sectors and see how it supports so that then uh, the women are enabled, they will not only uh, fed for their families, but then in our countries, because uh, care, domestic care is uh, is available, then they can actually source uh, for themselves domestic uh, domestic care and take care of uh, their children. Now, the the whole issue of of the debt and the debt burden, maybe I would uh, leave it to Jayati and the others. But I think, as I mentioned, the point is that um, uh, wh wh uh, wh when our 
economists are thinking about uh, the sectors to actually focus on for the economic stimulus programs. And this is where the borrowing comes. The question is whether uh, our countries need to be sensitized again to look at those sectors where women are concentrated. I think uh, this is where I see the gap. Maybe we look more at the broader macro economy as, as our countries, maybe we we'll look at the broader sectors. Maybe when we come from health, maybe we think about financial. Okay, it's not necessarily macro, but at the national level, we look at the financial sector, ask how we can support, maybe how we support manufacturing, how we support uh, maybe um, ICT and so forth. And these are mostly sectors where uh, women are not uh, fully engaged. So I think that's what I would want to say in that one. Thank you. Thank you. Jayati? Yeah, thank you. I want to pick up from what Jane was saying. And I, I, I agree. But you know, to be quite honest, and let me just be sort of brutally frank here, uh, the raising of consciousness about women's empowerment and the greater sensitization and the giving of rights to women in particular countries in the South cannot be a Northern project and should not be a Northern project. Uh, so I don't even think it should be discussed in a Northern Forum. Why are we discussing debt relief? Because that is a Northern project. It's the North that holds the debt. It's the North that is putting the screws on developing countries. It's the North that is preventing the fiscal expansion in developing countries. That's why we can discuss this in what is today a Northern Forum right here. Similarly, I would argue if the North really wants to help right now the pandemic, and people in the Global South, including women, the first thing they have to do, and all the citizens of Canada, UK, US, everywhere that are in this panel or in this program should be to stop hoarding vaccines. Canada has ordered 11 times its population worth of vaccines, the United States four times, UK twice, Europe four times. What is going on? And to stop preventing the suspension of intellectual property rights during the pandemic to allow vaccine production everywhere. Frontline health workers across Africa cannot access vaccines. While over here, everyone's desperate in the US because you know, children are not getting it yet. I mean, it is actually obscene. There is not enough public discussion about it. There is not enough outcry in the global North. So if you're really concerned about women in the global South, for heaven's sake, please begin by ensuring your governments do not fight the suspension of intellectual property rights in the WTO insist that their companies share the technology with CTAP in the WHO and do not hoard the vaccines. Sorry, but I really feel strongly about this and I'm tired of all these general statements, how do we help women in the South, when you're not saying anything about the policies that are actively preventing the suspension of the pandemic in the developing world. Thank you, that's very, very well said. Uh, Diane, a quick word from you, and then I'm going to pass it over to Andrew for any uh, any one minute comment you may have, and then we'll close up. Diane? Well, this year the UK has the presidency of the G7. So certainly, you know, we think debt and debt restructuring should be central to what the UK government does, and, and women's organizations in the UK are trying to uh, raise this. And we're also uh, working, there's an organization called the W7, which brings together women's organizations, not only from the North, but from the South, to think about how to put pressure on, on the formal G7 deliberations. I think when Canada was president of the G7, you had something similar. There was a, a similar kind of parallel NGO women's movements. So in the UK, we work, women's organizations are working in this together with women's organizations from the global south to think about how do we get those issues on the agenda of the G7. So, you know, that's, it's not how, it's up to women in the south, what they do with that space. The question is, how do we in the north make sure there is more fiscal space for them to do whatever it is they decide to do? So that will be our orientation uh, directed to the UK government as G7 president this year. Thank you. Andrew, any final comments? Yeah, thanks. Maybe just uh, just two things uh, and apologies because my uh, my line was uh, was freezing with uh, my kids uh, and their online schools here at home. Um, the first is obviously very much hear you on, on the vaccine question. That's obviously something we are are struggling with very much um, 
uh, here in Canada. So uh, certainly it's something that we're very aware of. Um, the second thing is that uh, more generally on discussions with debt in these uh, internationally, I mean, I think the real challenge, and this is not to absolve any, any, uh, any OECD countries of, blame, of, of uh, responsibilities in this, but it's very complicated now with the, with the, the current uh, landscape of creditors. And, and it's not going to be easy negotiating debt, uh, debt restructurings or debt forgiveness, certainly not as easy it was as it was in the 2000s. So I think it means for those who are engaged in efforts to try and uh, influence uh, whether it's G7 or G20, those are part, that's part of it, but uh, it, that's not all of it. And I think we're, you know, it, it, things are gonna have to uh, be done differently this time around. Great, thank, thank you, Andrew. And thanks to all of you, all the panelists for being and sharing your, your, your couple of hours with us and with this wider audience. It's just been a great, rich discussion uh, and intensely important information at this time. So, I mean, I think it's impossible to sum up the presentation and the discussion, but I, I, I wanna highlight a, a couple of things if I can. First, it's hard to overstate the urgency of the multiple crises that lower income countries are facing right now and the need for global action, absolutely. Um, and I think it was well said by Bob Ray uh, on Tuesday, you know, that, that the, the, the global north needs to get its act together and, and, um, and give to others what they are trying to give to themselves. Second, whether we believe in uh, a crisis being an opportunity or not, um, it's very important that we promote a recovery that is sustainable and that is inclusive, as inclusive as possible. And gender equalities have been amplified during this crisis, as was uh, we were we, we've been told and we heard and we keep reading about. And rebuilding progress towards SDG five um, is critical in the months uh, to come. So the presentations today have shown how important gender equality is at all levels of policy, nationally and internationally, probably even uh, you know, uh, provincially and further down, even at the community level. But there are no clear do's and don'ts for economic policy and for debt relief. So how to strengthen these commitments will be a key task for all of us. We'll ensure that the results of the expert discussion today uh, will be made available and will be shared with policymakers. Uh, Professor Ghosh's um, paper will be published, as I think I mentioned, and, and we will continue the debate, hopefully with all of you. Um, and, and we will continue to try to engage more deeply with partners across, across the world uh, in the Global South to help ensure that lessons are um, are learned and insights are gleaned um, and tools and methodologies are understood. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you all to the speakers, the PEP colleagues and everybody in the audience. Uh, we hope uh, we can connect very soon and um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon, evening and see you, see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks.